Human Eye and the Colorful World Lecture This is a quite simple and a short topic so I hope it will be interesting so let's start with the human eye the human eye is obviously one of the most important organ in any living organism right as you all know it's a sensory organ it helps us to experience vision vision is nothing but a method of visualizing objects which we usually come across so now let's see how the human eye looks okay so given below are some of the pictures of the human eye as you all know some beautiful human eyes okay now let's look to the structure of the human eye so coming to the scientific aspect of the human eye now is the time to analyze the biological features of the human eye given below is a picture which you will usually find it in any of the book so this is actually the how it looks for a biologist now let's learn about the functioning of the human eye so in, in a simple word the human eye is just like a camera its lens system forms an image on the light sensitive screen called as a retina the light enters the eye through a thin membrane called cornea it forms a transparent bulge on the front surface of the eyeball the eyeball is approximately spherical in shape most of their fraction of light rays entering the eye occur at the outer surface of the cornea the crystalline lens merely provides a finer adjustment of the focal length required to focus on the object at different conditions we find a structure called iris behind the cornea the iris is the dark muscular diaphragm and controls the size of the pupil the pupil regulates and controls the amount of the light entering the eye so basically it's a very complex cascade of reactions involved which you will be understanding it slowly now in continuation the eye lens forms an inverted real image on the object on the retina the retina is a delicate membrane having enormous number of light sensitive cells okay these signals are then sent to the brain with the help of the optic nerves okay now the brain interprets these signals and finally processes the information so that we can perceive the objects which are just in front of us this is how we see an object so coming to the eye lens the eye lens is composed of a fibrous and a jelly like material okay it's composed of a fibrous and a jelly like material its curvature can be modified to some extent with the help of the ciliary muscles. The change in the curvature of the eye lens can thus change the focal length. When the muscles are relaxed, the lens becomes very thin so that its focal length increases. Fine. This enables us to see distant objects very clearly. So when we have to look at objects which are very near to the eye, the ciliary muscles have to contract. This increases the curvature of the eye lens and the eye lens becomes very thick. As the eye lens becomes very thick, the focal length of the eye tends to decrease okay as the focal length of the eye decreases we can consequently look at the nearer objects a bit clearly 
So how is this all happening? This is a specially built-in mechanism of the human eye. We are all lucky to have this. So this particular mechanism is scientifically called as accommodation. I repeat, accommodation. However, the focal length of the islands cannot be decreased below a certain limit. So to see an object comfortably and distinctly, we must hold it about 25 centimeters from the eye. The minimum distance at which objects can be seen most distinctly without strain is called as a least distinct of vision. It is called as a near point also. Sometimes the crystalline lens of old people becomes milky and cloudy. This condition is called as cataract. This causes partially or complete loss of vision. It's actually possible to restore vision through a cataract surgery. Fine. So let's move on to the defects usually experienced with the human eye. So the defects of the human eye. In general, we come across two types of vision defects. One is called as a myopia and the other one is called as hypermyopia. So let's start with myopia. Okay. So a person with myopia can see near objects clearly but cannot see a distant object. A person with this defect has far point nearer than infinity. So in a myopic eye, the image of the distance is formed in front of the retina and not at the retina. This defect may arise due to excessive curvature of the islands or elong elongation of the eyeball. Fine. Then how do we correct this defect? It has to be corrected, right? So for a patient suffering with myopia, certain correction has to be done and this correction can be done perfectly with the help of a concave lens so by placing a concave lens in front of the eye the defect gets done now let's move on to hypermyopia it is the opposite case of myopia here the person cannot see the nearer objects. The nearer point becomes farther than 25 cm. Such a person has to keep a reading material much beyond for him to see. This is because the light rays form a close focus point behind the retina. And this is because the focal length is too long or the eyeball becomes very small. So how can this be corrected? When we have a solution for hypermyopia, this problem can be solved with the help of a concave lens. Sorry, convex lens, not a concave. Hypermyopia is solved using a convex lens. And this is how it can be solved. Please have a look at the diagram. The convex lens helps the proper focusing of the image on the retina. Now, let's discuss about a special phenomena. So, this phenomena is called presbyophia. It says that the power of accommodation of the eye usually decreases with aging. So nearby objects comfortably and distinctly without corrective eye glasses. It arises due to gradually weakening of the ciliary muscles with age, which is quite obvious. So let's move on to the reflect refraction of light through a prism, which we already studied in chapter 10, partly. 
so here what actually happens is white light gets split to several colors this phenomena is called as dispersion now let's have a recap of the angles of the prism please have a look Now, uh, let's study about the dispersion of the white light by the prism. We all know that the prism splits the white light into WebGaver and these seven set of colors are called as a spectrum. Now, Isaac Newton was the first to use a glass prism to obtain a spectrum from a sunlight. He tried to split the seven colors of the prism further by using an another small prism. However, he couldn't get more number of colors. So, are there only seven colors? Yes, there are only seven colors in a white light. And let's see why are there only seven colors in a white light. So what actually Newton done was, he placed another prism in an inverted position to this spectrum of seven lights, as shown in the figure. This was the obtainment of the seven lights and this is how he placed another inverted prism to see if these seven colors again disperse. So he put a second prism on the other side of the primary prism in this way. And what he saw there, again a white color was observed. So he finally concluded that white color only has seven colors of FKR only. Now let's study about the rainbow formation. A rainbow is a natural spectrum appearing in the sky after a rain shower, right? So it follows the same principle. It is caused by the dispersion of the sunlight by tiny water droplets present in the atmosphere. A rainbow is always formed in a direction opposite to that of a sun. Remember this. The water droplets act like tiny prisms. They refract and disperse the incident sunlight and then reflect it internally and finally refract it. Please have a look at the diagram. So Due to the dispersion of light and internal ref re reflection, the different colors reach the observer's eye. Similarly, we have many interesting atmospheric phenomena. So we move on to atmospheric refraction to have an idea of what are these, such as the twinkling of stars and the advanced sunrise and sunset. Now let's proceed with the twinkling of stars. The twinkling of a star is due to an atmospheric refraction of starlight, right? The starlight on entering the Earth's atmosphere undergoes refraction continuously before it reaches the Earth. Since the atmosphere bends the starlight towards the normal, the apparent position of the star is slightly different. The star appears slightly higher above from its actual position. This apparent position of the star is not stationary but keeps on changing slightly. And this is why we see the stars twinkling. And this is a representation of what actually happens. Please have a look. Similarly, we have another phenomenon of advanced sunset and sunrise, which means that the sun is visible to us about two minutes before the actual sunrise and two minutes after the actual sunset. But actual sunrise, we mean that the actual crossing of the horizon by the sun, right? The time difference between the two sunset and sunrise is about two minutes okay so given 
in the diagram below is how this phenomena occurs. This is because of the atmosphere and the varying refractive index of it. Now let's study about an interesting phenomena called as the Tyndall effect. Coming to the definition of Tyndall effect, it is a phenomena of scattering of light by colloidal particles and this effect is called as Tyndall effect. This phenomena is seen when a fine beam of sunlight enters a smoke filled room through a small hole. This scattering of light makes the particles visible. Tyndall effect can also be observed when sunlight passes through a canopy of a dense forest. At least you must be knowing this, right? So coming to the last part of this lecture, which is the summary. Let's proceed with the summary. So the, here we cover the basic definitions of dispersion, which is the phenomenon of scattering of light by colloidal particles which is similar to the Tyndall effect and the other one is the power accommodation the other two main definitions are myopia and hypermyopia that's it so this is the end thank you for watching